There we go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ted. I've known Ted for a while. Glad to be here. Yeah, I've. Um, let me tell you a little bit about my background. How I wound up here. Let's see there. Yeah. So, actually, I, I grew up in San Francisco, and I was always interested in electronics. And I had a neighbor across the street. Grew up right in the Haight Ashbury. And the neighbor across the street had a television repair shop down on, uh, on Haight Street. And when I was in junior high school, I'd go down there and uh, learn how to fix radios and televisions. And my father uh, signed me up as the youngest person ever to take the RCA home correspondence course in radio and television repair. So uh, that stood me well. I was always in electronics. I remember the first transistor I was able to get. CK722. And then when, uh, when I got into Cal, Berkeley, went, went to a little high school in San Francisco, uh, went to Cal, uh, electrical engineering, um, I managed to uh, pay my way through school fixing televisions at a repair shop just off of campus. So I really knew how televisions worked. And then when I was at Cal, I... Um, I got into the work study program, uh, which was an interesting uh, adventure where you could, uh, for six months, you would work in industry somewhere and then go to school for six months. And I managed to land a job at Ampex, but Ampex video file, not the place down in Redwood City, but this was a place down in Sunnyvale that made, uh, used uh, two inch wide uh, videotape uh, for storing single frame documents. They could store thousands of documents on a reel of tape. And it was a big system, uh, computer floors and the whole thing. But I really learned, I was mentored by some great people that uh, invented videotape recording and whatnot. So I really learned what proper video was. <laughs> Fixing televisions, you really don't get a uh, that precise of view. Um, and then because the, the, the fortune, one of my uh, uh, other employees at, uh, at, at uh, Ampex was Nolan Bushnell, who may not be the best engineer, but was one of the best entrepreneurs I ever met uh, at the time. Uh, well, I didn't know it at the time, but uh, he was. And, and, he, uh, and so I was, and I'm an analog engineer. I wanted to be a radio engineer, radio and television and analog stuff. I, didn't, I thought digital was kind of, well, Fortunately, Cal forced me to learn digital stuff, uh, thank God. And uh, uh, I wound up, uh, Nolan wound up hiring me uh, uh, right off the bat. Uh, he went out and started uh, uh, Syzygy Company and did uh, computer space, uh, or the, the, arguably the first coin-operated amusement device on the market. It wasn't very successful, but it was there and he had done it. He had done it. So... When it came to designing Pong, I, I couldn't say it couldn't be done because he had done it. Um, so anyway, and, and he also hired me because I was cheap. You know, I was <laughs> I was 24 years old, 1972, and uh, and he gave me 10% of the stock in the company, which was nice. But I didn't, being an ex radical from Berkeley, it didn't seem like it was very important at the time. But it was sure fun working with the guys in a small team you know, in a, in a startup company. And in about, and he assigned me the task of, uh, of building this uh, uh, ping pong game on the television screen. Uh, uh, and he told me he had a big contract from General Electric to make a home game out of it. So that meant it had to cost like probably $20, $30 total cost. <laughs> so I, I started putting chips together and all digital logic. No, this is, it was a, Intel had the 4004, but that was really not of much use in something like this. And uh, so it was all just TTL, which was really cheap at the time. And um, I put together this prototype uh, and, I, and this, thinking of the interface, the obvious thing was potentiometers to control. I'm sure everybody's seen Pong or get, has the idea of how that thing worked. Uh, and so potentiometers were the main interface but the other thing that worked well was the fact that we had a television the whole thing was based uh, uh, a raster scan home television I could go to the to, to the drugstore Walgreens and buy a black and white Hitachi television for about 60 70 dollars 
and uh, hack it, turn it into a, uh, a monitor and uh, put it in a cabinet and uh, with a Pong board and we were in business. And uh, I'm sure you've all heard the story about, you know, the first problem we had with the machine it was on, in the Andy Capps Tavern. It was just a, just a very crude prototype. I'll show it to you later uh, in a box on a bar top. The thing start, stopped working pretty quickly. And it didn't surprise me because it was just lashed together. We didn't have any money. We had no time. We had to hurry fast. So I went over to the, to the bar to fix it after work. And uh, the reason it didn't work was it was so full of quarters, it wouldn't take anymore. So I filled my, I split the take with the bartender, as, as was the deal, took the rest of them to work the next day, dumped them on Nolan's desk and said, I found the problem with the machine. It's making too much money. So, hmm. And it turns out, he really didn't think that was going to be a good game. It was just the simplest, basic game you could think of that would give me the skills to get a, a moving image on a raster stand display with digital logic. And uh, I think he wanted to do a driving game or something. He thought that was going to be the winner. But anyhow, since it worked and I tried to make it fun with uh, the sound and the speed up and stuff like that, uh, we put it out there and uh, it took off. And all of a sudden, our business plan was set. We we're going to sell as many pumps as we could make uh, real fast. Um, and, and, uh, and I'll talk about the other companies later. But I, in 94, I started a, a, a slot machine company, which has got some very interesting human interface issues. And then a Zowie place at a child's place. And I did that with Interval Research, spun out of Interval Research. And it basically merged a, a kid's uh, video game that played on a PC with a kid's playset and tracked all the objects on the playset. And then in 2005, I started a company called IMMI, which was going to compete with Nielsen. We were a, a raw startup funded by Draper Fisher Jervison. And uh, we were using acoustic matching technology to... Uh, measure audience participation. So I'll talk about those things. So in general, uh, uh, an arcade game, you know, any or any requirement, you have to, the interface has to allow the user to control the process in there and be fun at the same time. Um, you're gonna use sound, pictures, and sometimes tactile feedback. Uh, and, and as we know, you want the, I want the user to feel that he is interacting with the task and not get the tools in the way of what he's, of what he's doing. Uh, so, so here is an early uh, uh, pinball machine from turn of the century. Uh, and you could see there that the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the plunger, the flipper and the coin mech, uh, and it's a tabletop game, which to today's standards, people would just steal it. <laughs> If it had any money in it, that would be the end of that. So, um, so the other thing we learned is that Godzilla plays our machines. If that machine steals your quarter, the player feels he has the right to try to destroy the machine. Um, and, uh, and it is full of money, so it's uh, you know, a pretty good uh, target. And, uh, and if the machine is too difficult to control or master, people just won't play it. I mean, you get immediate feedback and uh, you, you, you'll learn really quick if it's, if it's not, a, not a good product. Uh, we've had cigarette burns, people spill beer on them, and uh, occasionally people can knock them over. Uh, but that, again, is a, a well-known problem that you don't want the machine to fall over if people get too aggressive. And some of our machines, people can get very aggressive, get very busy playing these things. Here's a picture of computer space. Now, this is a machine that Nolan, now that this machine, I don't know, hopefully many of you have seen it, it's basically the space war game that Steve Russell did at MIT on a PDP-1, which was a raster scan, excuse me, it was a vector scan display. And uh, you know, it cost uh, roughly a million bucks back then. And certainly it was not equipped. Now Nolan turns out at the time was going to University of Utah and uh, he paid his way through school with uh, working at a arcade, Lagoon Corporation in uh, Salt Lake City. And he actually managed the uh, 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 pinball arcade there. 
And so he understood the economics of the business, which I, it was a little bit of marketing there for him. And, uh, and he also saw, because uh, 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 University of Utah was one of the few places that had a PDP-1. And of course, every PDP-1 was playing space war. So he saw that and he said, man, if I could put a coin slot on that, I could make some money. But he knew enough about economics that, you know, he'd have to probably charge $10 to play to begin to even to begin to make money. So he had that in the back of his head. And he came to Ampex, and it was his first job. And, uh, and, and that, the idea of making a raster scan version of, uh, of Space War still stuck in his head. And, uh, uh, and he was going to use a, a mini computer because that was the way it was done. Uh, and, and, and have an arcade that had like five or six display kiosks run by one mini so you could sell, share the cost. And in fact, uh, just before he left Ampex to go off and build this thing, he, he uh, had assigned his wife the accounting task of buying uh, a supernova or some one of the first you know two thousand dollar mini computers uh he bought a couple of them and or uh, tried to and his wife wouldn't send the check <laughs> fortunately by the time he uh and the computers were so slow in those days they, they did nothing at video rates video rates you know every you know you got three or four megahertz video signal and there's just no way a mini computer is going to run that fast and so he kept having to do more digital logic to do those tasks. And by the time he realized that he didn't have any computers on order, he realized he didn't need the computers because it was just a little bit more of a state machine and he could do the whole thing and get rid of the computer. And that was really the, that breakthrough. And the other breakthrough was the Bushnell motion circuit, which is how can you move an object on a raster scan display to one of you know random position, thousands of positions on the screen, with uh, with uh, no memory, uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, and no, no, this is before frame buffers, any of that stuff, and so it was a very clever circuit, a very clever technique of having a sync, a digital sync generator, and then another sync generator like counter setup, but that was slightly off, and so the. So it would move, the image would appear to move from the static background image. And uh, uh, all of a sudden we had motion. You didn't know where it was, but you knew it was moving. You knew which direction it was moving in and you knew if it hit a paddle or an object, you could reverse course. So those were the breakthroughs that made that happen. And, uh, and, and so that was, now the problem with computer space, one of the big problems was the interface, the control panel. It's got push buttons on there that rotate right, rotate left, and fire. And, and, it, and, and it was uh, it really, really hard to manipulate. The only place this thing ever really worked or made money was at the Stanford Student Union and uh, other places where they taught physics because it, you know, it, it demonstrated gravity uh, and elliptical orbits and stuff like that, which is not what the average game player turns out is really after. So the obvious interface for this machine, human interface, would be a joystick, uh, a, a rotating, a three-axis joystick. Um, and they built one. Somehow they built one. Uh, the first prototype had the joystick in there. And one of their first locations for this machine was at Eastridge Shopping Center, Eastridge Mall, down in San Jose. And unfortunately, it was placed right next to a Sears store. And we believe someone went in there and got a pipe wrench and just took the goddamn joystick off, just broke the thing right off. So that was the end of the joystick. And they only had money and they got, they got the buttons. So that was why that one didn't, did not work too well. But it was certainly an innovative cabinet, which we discussed when we were doing Pong. Should we go with fiberglass? And I went to the place that was building these things and the smell and the, oh, my God, you can only make one of one mold per day per machine, you couldn't scale up. And so anyway, we learned from that. And, uh, but we had Pong and, uh, and I've already discussed the issues on that. So here's Pong, uh, uh, the original Pong cabinet. Uh, you'll notice that it's a Hitachi television with a cardboard bezel in the back. 
uh, the primary interface besides putting the coin in. Oh, I got a funny story about this. So when 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 we did when I first did the Pong prototype, got it to work, uh, and we had to. It, Nolan said it had to have instructions, and I said, well. If you have to read instructions to play a game, it's not going to work. It has to be obvious. It has to just fall right to hand. And we had an argument about that. I said, pinball machines don't have instructions. He says, yes, they do. And I looked out. We had a bunch of pinball machines in the back. And uh, sure enough, in the lower left-hand corner, there actually are instructions for what the, what, how many points. So, okay. So the instructions go like this. Deposit quarter. Ball will serve automatically and avoid missing ball for high score. So I, 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 those are words to live by. Uh, and that was, and the sound is another one that we, we had an argument about. Um, uh, the, the, the sound of, a, of the pong ball bouncing is ubiquitous, people know it. Uh, Nolan said he wanted sounds of a roar of a crowd of thousands cheering a successful volley. And <laughs> Ted Dabney, that Dabney said he wanted boos and hisses. Well, you know, I'm already over budget on the thing. It was kind of a failure in my mind because it wasn't going to be a consumer product, the amount of parts I had in it. By this time, I had 70 ICs in the damn thing. I, I didn't know how to make boos, hisses, or cheering with digital logic. So I said, okay. And I went back and in about half a day, I poked around the vertical sync generator and found tones that were appropriate, added a few 555 timers, and uh, lo and behold, there are the sounds. Nolan was not too impressed, and I said, well, if, if you don't like it, here's the wire wrap gun, you do it, I can't do it. So that became the sounds, and it's been much heralded how wonderful and appropriate the sounds were. <laughs> the other thing is the uh, potentiometers. Um, now, I, being a TV repairman, just went down to, uh, literally went down to uh, Sunnyvale Electronics. And any old timers around here remember Sunnyvale Electronics and uh, bought a couple of uh, potentiometers that used to, you know, replacement pots for television sets. And uh, let's see if this is, whoops. Uh, there it is. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, so after, after a week on location, the pot, the, the pot died, the pots wore out. They just started, you know, going, what's going on here? Well, I realized this thing was making over a hundred dollars a week in earnings, maybe more, maybe twice that, which would be 400 coins a week. And every time you put a coin in each pot, we get at least 15 turns. We did the math. It was 24,000 turns a month in these cheap television uh, potentiometers, they wouldn't hack it. So uh, at that time we went, and now we were, we were selling pongs as fast as we could make them. So we went to Allen Bradley, which, you know, makes beautiful, be beautiful stuff. I don't believe they make pots anymore, but they made, we bought some nice Allen Bradley pots. And then eventually Allen Bradley even said, look, you're buying so many from us. We'll make you a special extra long life potentiometer. <laughs> So we actually had that. So most of the Pongs had that in it. Uh, but by the way, that, that potentiometer, turns out it just got old and died after about 10 years. It fell apart, even if you weren't using it. But hey, we made our money. We were on to the next game. Um, now we also, yeah, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, I, I, I'm sure everybody's familiar with potentiometers. But if you think about it, we thought about uh, a slide potentiometer uh, uh, but slide potentiometer, you just can't have the fine adjustment. The pot is really a wonderful device. You can move it rapidly. You can get to a fine position. Uh, it really is a pretty good interface device. Uh, uh, very accurate. And we had a nice big knob to, to do that. Um, and the slide potentiometer had other problems too, because usually there was an opening. There had to be an opening and you could pour stuff in that opening. And believe me, in, in our in an arcade, a bar environment, things will get poured in, in that. So here's the original Pong prototype. Uh, this is the one that the coin box overflowed. It is uh, currently, it's, it's at the, I've donated it to the Computer History Museum. Uh, it's on display. Unfortunately, when it's there, you can't see the back of the machine inside the machine. 
But this is actually, this is so primitive. There's a five volt power supply there and there's a piece of vector board. There's did not have a wire wrap panel, couldn't afford that. I just put wire wrap sockets into vector board and it's just daisy chained. And the fact that it worked at all, it's in a chassis because at one point we took it around to the couple of uh, uh, video game, Bally in particular, the biggest video game manufacturer in the world at that time was Bally. Bally was smart. After Nolan had done computer space and it was kind of a flop, but it was different. It was new. And Bally was smart enough to understand that old adage about keep your uh, friends close, but your enemies closer. And they needed to see what, what, what the future was. And they put a bet. So they gave Nolan a small contract to, to design them a video game, a pinball machine, and some kind of an arcade attraction. And Nolan actually worked on a pinball machine while I was doing Pong. And once Pong took off and it was... It was like a, a rocket took off. Uh, uh, it, it, you know, everybody wanted it, and Nolan did not want to give it to Bally. He said, we want to build this ourselves. So, so he had to go back to Chicago and convince them that they didn't want it. <laughs> I don't know how he pulled that off. Uh, and we did give him another game, and they eventually copied it anyhow. Everybody copied the game. Uh, yeah, that was... Uh, so... Uh, yeah, so we, we would take, you could see the TV set was just an Itachi, and I used the uh, the antenna terminals as the uh, connector. There was sound, I used the speaker, the sound in this TV set as our sound. So uh, so there was ground, video, and uh, audio. And if you wanted to adjust the volume, you had to reach your hand around inside the cabinet and turn the, find the volume control and turn it up. Uh, and we, the original, the original machines had a open frame five volt power supply. Uh, the first dozen machines that we made, and uh, unfortunately, that power supply had a knob on it to adjust the five volts out. And remember, these machines are being sold to people that were were operating pinball machines, which required a file, a big screwdriver, a hammer, and uh, didn't work well with the digital electronics. So if the machine wasn't making enough money or wasn't loud enough or whatever, they would just start turning knobs. And unfortunately they could boost the power supply up and burn a board out. So thank God about that same time Fairchild had invented the LM309, a single five volt power supply on a chip so that we put good use to that. So, um, but that, but then, and then we had a cabinet it turns out we got lucky, the cabinets. There was a big manufacturer in Santa Clara called P.S. Hurlbut. They were a cabinet manufacturer and they were just, had no customers. They were getting low on business and uh, they were just poised for us. They knew what they were doing. They were able to design, help us design a cabinet that not only was attractive, but it uh, would withstand shipping and uh, 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 brutal. So that the cabinet, we were very lucky to get that. Uh, we had an issue with the television sets uh, because these were not monitors. These were televisions from Hitachi. And uh, so they had uh, UHF antennas, they had warranties, they had, and we were buying thousands of them. And uh, it turns out that uh, there were some kickbacks involved and we had some uh, unfortunate, had to let some people go uh, anyway. So then the next game, so then what happened was people started copying Pong, so everybody was making Pongs, and I think, I, my guess is Nolan has different numbers, but I guess we made about three or 4,000 Pongs, but I think there were over ten or 12,000 made. We only had a fraction of the market. Uh, as they, they say, invitation is a serious form of flattery, but I say don't, don't applaud, throw money. Uh, so the, the way to get this solved, problem, the problem was to design the next game, and that was something that the competition couldn't do. And so, but we were so understaffed. I mean, it was me and two techs. We were trying to debug Pong boards as I'm trying to design the next generation game. Uh, and uh, so I came up with this game, Space Race, um, which was, uh, let me see, I think I have a better, yeah. So you had two, two uh, rocket ships and you could, the joystick would just go up or down and there was a star field. Half of the stars were going left, half were going right. And you avoided the stars. 
It was not a great game, but it was a game and it was something else that the competition uh, uh, couldn't do. This is what, ah, this is amusing. This is the logic board that was in the space race. So you'll see here, we have the five volt power supply, the LM309. Uh, all it was off board were the, were the controls and a transformer. Uh, but to get the spaceship, this was 1973. And there really weren't any ROMs at that time. And uh, you can see our ROM here. Uh, this is a prototype board. So we had a, but there's the half outline of a spaceship. <laughs> and uh, we just folded it over logically. And that was our, that was our ROM, <laughs> much cheaper. Eventually we did, we did actually use ROMs and, and the first one was a driving game. Uh, but that was, but the joystick, uh, the joystick, let me tell you about that. Again, we knew that Godzilla played the machine, so it had to be durable, and, and, and that was made out of uh, fiber-reinforced Lexan. We actually had Jim Hebb, who was a mechanical engineer from, from Ampex, who had uh, left, and he was up in Grass Valley, and, uh, and, he, and this was a job that was well beneath him from designing videotape heads, but he did uh, get the tooling, get it designed, and there was a a stainless steel shaft in the middle of it and micro switches behind it. Uh, so it, it, I, I, these, were, these were really very durable and it was also sealed for any liquids, stuff like that. I, I really don't like that start button, but we didn't have, it was just an expedient and I'm amazed. Well, we didn't sell that many machines, but that would have been beaten up pretty quickly. Uh, then we designed Gotcha. <laughs> now, Gotcha was inspired. You can see the image on the screen back there. Gotcha was inspired by a Pong board that I was, we were debugging, and there was some solder bridge or a defective chip. And the score digits, the circuit that created the score segment, seven segment score, screwed up and put segments all over the screen. And ah, I could move them and open them up and actually you could then make a maze that was dynamic. And it really was, I argue, Pac-Man stole my idea. <laughs> but this particular one I have a picture of here, I wanted to show you because George Farrakko was our, our, our we had a, uh, uh, a product designer. He was, he was very good, but he was an interesting man. And uh, he, we built, I mean, I think maybe four or five machines with the joystick replaced by a pink round object, which uh, anyway, uh, Nolan nixed that. Uh, uh, we didn't want to have, you'll notice all our, all the arcade pinball machines back in those days featured pictures of uh, uh, scantily clad women and all kinds of, you know, male stuff. And Nolan did not want that. We wanted to be able to put our machines in a, in a restaurant, a nice restaurant or bar and not, and blend in. And that was Nolan's philosophy. And anyhow, George got these uh, boobs put on this machine, which anyway, did, did not last, but hey, we tried. Uh, and then the driving game. Now that, that was a breakthrough. That was a real, that was a real change. Um, we had a human interface. We had the, the steering wheel. We had to invent a shift. It was a, a four speed or three speed, I don't know, and the brake, pe the pedals, and the pedals really scared me because uh, people are going to step on them and they're going to stomp on them as hard as they can. And uh, uh, once again, Jim Hebb came through with the design and it was uh, fiber reinforced, fiberglass reinforced Lexan. Uh, the steering wheel was from auto supply people. Uh, funny story. Uh, <laughs> we had a very young workforce, uh, President Warner, when he bought the company, asked us, where do you put people when they get over 30 years of age? You put them in a pit somewhere. Everybody was young. So, uh, you know, they were obviously people, were, employees were stealing their steering wheels, putting them on their cars. And Nolan said, hey, pretty soon all the cars in the parking lot will have these steering wheels and they won't be stealing anymore, which, which came to pass. <laughs> but uh, again, you could pick the whole machine up with that steering wheel. Uh, the gear shift, uh, once again, had a, a stainless steel shaft down the middle of it, and it was a plastic housing with uh, real micro switches. The other thing I want to point out is the door, the coin door. 
you remember the original Pong machine had just a bare coin mech. And it was really a problem because for operational efficiency, you want to have a coin door, which means from the front of the machine, you can put a key in, unlock the door, open it up, take the money out and put it back. With the Pong, you had to pull the Pong away from the wall of the uh, room to get at the back and open the back up. So that was really inconvenient. And we, our, our receptacle for the money was a bread pan, uh, uh, which was really unacceptable, but that's all we had. And uh, so it took us about a, a year of being in business before we could actually tool up. Uh, we called it a Chicago style coin door with uh, this one had two coin mechs on it and all the nice stuff. Uh, so th that was a big change. The other thing about Grand Track that uh, was interesting was again, people were copying our stuff all the time. And I, I got this brilliant idea. Well, I hired one of the engineers that I hired uh, was uh, 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 Harold Lee, who was a digital logic designer and a chip designer. And so, and I hired him to do uh, video game design. And he said, hey, and I, and I wanted him to be able to design a custom chip that we could put in all our video games, like a sync generator or something, uh, so that people couldn't copy it. It would be a, our proprietary chip. Uh, and Harold came back and said, you know, that's not going to work. You guys are changing technologies too fast. By the time we got a custom chip made, it would be obsolete. But I think I could put uh, Pong on, uh, on a chip. And that became the project, the home Pong. But meanwhile, we did have a ROM in that game. In the Grand Track, we put a ROM in there. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, what was the name of the company? Uh, one company could make ROMs back in those days in Silicon Valley. And so we had a custom part uh, that was the ROM. And it was in a 16 pin or no, 24 pin dip package. And, uh, and I had to, and they said, well, what's your, what's your part number? And I go, huh? Yeah, it's a custom part. You got to give us a part number. Oh yeah. How about 74181, which was a 16 or 24 pin TTL chip. Looked just the same. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, after we start shipping these things, you're getting calls from distributors around the world saying, hey, uh, the part doesn't work. What do you mean it doesn't work? It's just, we put a part in it. Why are you putting a part in? They were knocking our board off. They were trying to copy our board. And so they would, you put in that, and that the ROM chip, ROM chip took plus 12, uh, plus five and minus five. So uh, it would, any TTL would go up in smoke. So that was my little, Nobody ever knocked off the driving game for that reason. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, they also the funny thing about the input, human, human interface. Uh, the driving game was a, uh, was a third person game. You're looking down on a, on, a, on a racetrack with cars going around the racetrack and you're steering your car and there's two or three other players with you steering their cars. Uh, well, I don't recommend driving a car by looking third person from the sky. It just doesn't work. And, 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 and uh, it turns out you had to, the algorithm for turning the car was the car would turn when you rotated the steering wheel. You stop rotating the wheel, the car would go straight. So it was really, uh, was it, integrating or differentiating uh, the motion. But nevertheless, it seemed natural. No one ever complained about it or pointed out that it wasn't the way a car really steers. Uh, but uh, that's how we did it. And, and those are the sort of things you would have to do. But it, rem it was remarkable that nobody ever complained or noticed that the car didn't really uh, respond correctly. Thank God. Then we did a game. Oh, here's an interesting game. Touch me. So... So now we, by this time, we became the dominant coin-operated game manufacturer. We were bigger than Bally in making coin-op games. And, and coin-op games typically would sell, we would sell them for around $1,000 to $1,500. They would go to a distributor in the city. The city distributor would then sell 
the games to an operator who would put them in a bar, arcade, a location somewhere and split the take. So these things had to make a certain amount of money in a certain period of time. Um, and the main, one of the main cost factors in these video games was a large cabinet and the display. Uh, uh, and we were, going, we were starting to go to color, so it was going to get expensive. Nolan said, hey, can we design a video game without video? <laughs> so Touch Me was born. And Touch Me, uh, fascinating. Uh, we never sold many of them. It was a very small cabinet. But uh, it, what happened, you put your coin in, start the game, and it would give you a tone. Every button had a different tone on it. And it would give you, and you'd play that tone back by hitting that button. It would light up and, uh, and make the tone on that button. And then it had another. Pretty soon it was two tones, and then three tones, and then four. And it would go on and on and on. I don't know, any of you guys seen the Simon game by Milton Bradley? You know, the home game? Well, uh, that was done by, turns out, <laughs> Ralph Baer patented that. And he patented Touch Me. Touch Me was out in production before Ralph Baer ever started writing the patent. He basically wrote a fraudulent patent and knocked off completely, touch me, as a home game, as a uh, arcade thing. So we couldn't make any money off of it as an arcade thing. And uh, we eventually did when we were doing in the consumer business. I believe Bristow actually did make, some, we made it some cheap versions of a touch me game. And when uh, Marvin Glass, threatened to sue us, we showed them some uh, 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 service manuals for the Touch Me and they, they backed off. We did not want to mess with Pats too much. We should have at that time, but we just didn't do it. Uh, we were too busy. But that was an interesting human interface uh, experiment and it was very successful. Unfortunately, just not for us. Um, yeah, yeah, I already talked about that. Whoops, there we go. So, ah, now we come to an interesting game that used another interface. I'm sorry, I don't have a better picture, uh, but it was a football game, um, arcade football game. It had to be somewhere around 76, 75, 76. Uh, and, uh, and it used a trackball. It had two trackballs in it. Let me see if I can. Where is it? There it is, I skipped over, wow. Yeah, so there is a picture of the prototype trackball. Now, this trackball was really interesting because uh, uh, there were we did not invent the trackball, but we think we invented the most indestructible trackball you ever saw. So this used, uh, there were two shafts and a bearing the thing rode on. So it would, it would sit here and rotate the shaft and the shaft would rotate and there was a, uh, a teeth in this plastic piece and there was optical quadrature, two LEDs and photodiodes in quadrature. And so you could get a rotation really quickly. There were two of these. These were the same ones that were used in the driving game. Um, but one interesting effect, side effect, uh, was that what happens when somebody spills beer on this thing, right? or soda pop or Coke or something like that. Well, it turns out this was designed, the way it was designed, it would actually increase, improve performance. It would make better traction on the ball here. And we had a drain in the cabinet so that if you did pour a beer on it, it would piddle on your foot. Let me get something here. <laughs> uh, yeah, here, I just happened to have, I borrowed this prototype from a friend here uh there it is uh and it used it just used the commercial uh, i don't know what kind of a ball it was for a ski ball or something like that anyhow bashi yeah it was uh that was that was uh and it turns out it was funny because that game the uh come on uh, uh, there it is. No, there. Uh, that game, uh, we thought it was going to be the best game in the world. We thought it was so good. We, we were doing really well. 
And we held the game back from production because we wanted to save it from when we needed it, when we needed a savior game. And, uh, and we would play this, Nolan, the execs would play this thing before lunch every day. And we put big money on the outcome of the game. And, uh, but we realized that we were all sweating. I mean, this really was a game that made you, made you uh, physically active. And then when we finally did eventually ship the game, we finally just gave up because we were, we were doing quite well. And we just, we just produced the game, put it in the, in the hopper. And it did not do that well. Did not do that well. Let me see if I can. Well, wait, there's a game. There, there's a game. Tank. There's another game. So we, this is the two-player tank game. And um, done by Key Games, which was a, actually owned by Atari. Uh, that was Nolan's trick. <laughs> I said we had dominated the coin-op manufacturer. We were the biggest uh, coin-op arcade manufacturer in the world at this point in time. And, uh, and, but the problem was we sold through distributors in the city and this, and the, distri the distribution channels were, uh, were all isolated based on jukebox distributor lines. So you, they had three different distributors in every city and we could only get one third of the distributors. So Nolan figured, Hey, I'll make my own competition. So his neighbor across the street was Joe Keenan. And, uh, we set him up, uh, with one of our best engineers, Steve Bristow. And, uh, and uh, had them compete against us. <laughs> and we would, we would uh, they were just down the, you know, across Santa Clara. Uh, and we would complain to our customers, oh, those key games guy, they stole our engineers and our customers loved it. And they'd go running over there and buy the machines thinking they were screwing Atari. That was fun. And it really helped us because when, when we did have some trouble, we were able to merge key games back into Atari. Uh, yeah. Okay, so let me talk about, well, I'm going to take a, I didn't really spend any time on, I started the consumer division. There really wasn't anything unique about human interface in that, except we had to make things really cheap and light. Uh, and uh, uh, the first home game was Pong and a consumer dedicated Pong. And that had a cheap potentiometer in it because God bless anybody who played 10,000 plays on a, or 500 plays on that machine will buy them a new machine. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, I started a bunch of companies and let me talk about this Odyssey slot machine. Um, I got a call from, uh, 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 oh, what's his name? Anyway, venture capitalist Angel. Dave Morse, he founded Amiga, and uh, and he and I were friends. And he said, "Let's start a slot machine company, and uh, and you know, let's do it Silicon Valley way." So, the Odyssey slot machine was born. Uh, it was a uh, a sixteen by nine CRT. Uh, uh, that was another problem. We had to make our own display. Uh, it had a touch screen, a full size touch screen, which was really unusual. Uh, 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 but that was what you needed in the in the arc, the slot machine casino environment, uh, and we also put a uh, a handle on it. Now, strangely enough, the operators, the casinos, did not want the handle. Why didn't they want the handle? Because it took up a couple inches of space, so they could pack in more slot machines. But uh, uh, our marketing department said, nope, nope, nope. I want the customers to know this is a slot machine. We would play six different games on the machine and you could choose which one you want. We, uh, we implemented, uh, there were a lot of issues with this. Uh, we wanted to make a machine that would give you a experience, a graphic experience at the time, better than you get on a home computer or anything, any television set. And, and we all had good sound in the machine. We had lots of media rich stuff. And as such, we had to use a hard disk to store all the data. The game was run on a, we used an IBM PC, no, an Intel PC motherboard because you could get more parts for much cheaper for $110. I could buy a Powell from motherboard that had uh, Ethernet and graphics and all this stuff, <clears throat> and so I, I would I did not want to design a yet another video game, so that's what it was. 
We also implemented uh, RSA public key cryptography uh, so we could actually protect our hard disk because uh, uh, all the machine data was on the hard disk. And, and if you loaded a, a cheat a, what called a GAF program in there, it would just never run because every time you played a game or started a game, it would do a, uh, a cryptographic signature analysis and make sure that it was the game that we shipped it with. And we had to get the rules changed for Las Vegas. We actually did a public offering. <laughs> we got the machine was licensed. And so I've got, I could go on for days about making slot machines in the gambling industry. Fascinating business, but there's a bunch of greed in there and it's not as much fun as the coin op business. Uh, let's see. Yeah, public key. We, yeah, oh, the, the bill validator was interesting because those machines on in the casinos in those days would take hundred dollar bills, so there's a lot of money in those machines, and and uh, and it turns out that you could people could make counterfeit currency that didn't look like currency, but it would register as a hundred dollar bill in the machine, and the bad guys had figured this out, and at one point. The, the manufacturer of the machine, JCM, uh, put a thing out, turn off the $100 bill acceptor. They're getting so many fake bills, they didn't want to back it up. And the casinos did that for a week or two, and they were losing so much money, it was cheaper to turn the bill validator back on and just take the losses. Uh, uh, so yeah, that was an interesting human interface. Uh, let's see what we got here. Okay, so then, oh, where, uh, I'm gonna get it, I'm gonna get it there. Okay, so I got these backwards. So I at one point worked at Interval Research. Uh, I don't know, Interval was a fascinating company, research group uh, put together by Paul Allen. Uh, and he had about a hundred uh, brilliant people, really, really wonderful, wonderful uh, PhDs, scientists, computer scientists, uh, working on inventions that they could then start a company. You wanted to spin companies out uh, instead of licensing technology. And I was brought in basically to help start a company from the technology they were designing, they were building. And the, one of the technologies, one of the learnings they did, they discovered that kids would rather, um, kids would rather play with objects, we're talking five-year-old, 10-year-olds, they would rather play with a, a, a play set than they would pushing a mouse around. So the idea was to merge a child's play set. Here it was Ellie's garden, the magic garden uh, with these characters. And you put them on this surface here and it would control the video game that was playing on your PC. So you had a video game on the PC that was controlled by the characters and it mimicked the, it merged the virtual and the physical world. And uh, it was a really good effect. It worked, it worked rather well. It was a engineering challenge, one of the hardest engineering projects I was ever involved with to make these characters, each character had a tracking device in it. The play field could scan these devices, could keep track of up to 10 objects within about uh, two millimeter accuracy. Uh, and uh, the tracking device in each thing cost maybe five cents. All it was was uh, a few turns of uh, magnet wire and a capacitor at a certain, it resonated at a certain frequency with a reasonably high Q. And uh, it was like, a, it was actually the technology behind it was like a, 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 an MRI machine. It would uh, 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 put out, pulses, echoes, and it would listen for them coming back and we figure out instantly where, where, uh, where it was. And uh, unfortunately it was a, a bust because uh, it turns out the uh, toy business is not like you think it would be. And the, uh, I don't wanna to be too cynical, but the, uh, the typical toy customer Christmas time is a grandparent or aunt or uncle walking through the aisles of Toys R Us and when they see Star Wars or some big uh, uh, brand on it, Disney, they'll buy it. They don't know if it's a good game or if it's a unique game. They just, you know, they just buy them. And so when the buyers would we try to sell it, they'd say, well, 
what characters have you licensed? Oh, no, we spent all the money on the chips and stuff. Oh, uh, how much, what's your advertising budget? Not much. So anyway, we did not, it was a bust, but it was a, a, a challenge. And that was, I think, a really cute one. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Okay, and here's one. I'm just about finished here. Uh, IMMI, Integrated Media Measurement, was a company I started back in, oh, I guess, 2005, something like that. And the idea was to, to put Nielsen out of business, <laughs> that uh, uh, Nielsen was measuring uh, media consumption on television in the home, only in the home, using diaries, uh, test customers, and they would be required to put in the diary what they were watching. And it was extremely inaccurate uh, and very slow, and it only measured in-home viewing uh, on certain channels. Uh, we realized that we, if we could get acoustic matching technology, uh, I'm sure most of you have heard of Shazam, now owned by uh, Apple Computer. Um, that, that's acoustic matching technology. It's some of the, the finest in the world, and we managed to get a license, the only license to Shazam technology they ever issued. And so we would have uh, uh, media monitors in our market areas in the, whatever cities we were doing the measurements in, and we'd, we'd monitor all the television and radio uh, and occasionally movies that were on in that area. And, every, and, and the panelists that were doing our viewing, test viewing, all they had to do, we gave them a free cell phone, a free cell phone, we paid the bill. All they had to do was keep the cell phone in their, in their possession all the time, wherever they were. And that was it. And uh, every 30 seconds, it would listen for 10 seconds to the audio in the background and match that up with uh, what we had recorded. And we could tell precisely what everybody was watching and do radio at the same time. And if we stored in our computers the first 10 minutes of a, of a new run theater movie, we could tell when people went to the movie. So we could start to match cross-platform and we actually measured, uh, we discovered in a sports test market uh, uh, that people that were avid sports viewers in Sacramento, when they drove to work and from work, they were all listening to a certain radio station. And lo and behold, and that the uh, ESPN could advertise on that radio station and uh, get their customers very cheaply. That was an insight. We also uh, uh, tested the Super Bowl win here and we discovered, oh, we were able to tell if viewers were watching it in home or out of home. We did that by giving them a USB dongle, okay? And the USB dongle, they just plug into the wall. It didn't do anything, but was discoverable. And it said, I am a Maya. That's all. So if it was at home, our cell phones would know they were at home. They were near that dongle. If they were in a bar or somebody else's house, turns out 30% of the people watching the Super Bowl were viewing out of home. So the Super Bowl ratings, viewing ratings were low by 30%. Uh, and we, <laughs> unfortunately, at the, end of this, at the end of the day, our data was so accurate, it showed that the, uh, it, it, the, the truth would show that the networks were not doing as well as they thought they were, that the bias results from Nielsen were making them look better. And here we come, we're going to tell you the truth and it's going to put you out of business. <laughs> anyway, it was a, uh, a logical success, but not a financial success. So anyway, uh, I think, uh, you know, new forms of entertainment require new human interfaces. Uh, it's great when you have constraints. You know, if anybody ever designed without constraints, it's not much fun. And uh, anyhow, that's that's it. Are, are there any questions? Anybody? Well, um, it's amazing. I mean, long before Shazam, you were uh, doing this, um, recognizing audio and video. Um, so many technical achievements and. I think that they are a lot of a lot of take home messages for the HCI community here. Uh, you might want to just stop um, sharing so that people can see your uh, see oh. see you even bigger. Oh yeah, my um, beautiful face. And, uh, anyway, I'm I'm looking at the chat. Um, there's probably also <laughs> there's two other ways to um, 
to look at uh, um, the uh, um, questions. Um, so I'm not noticing other uh, the questions right now. Where am I supposed to be looking? How do I stop sharing? <laughs> Just uh, there's a black, uh, there's a green thing up there. Yeah. Oh, stop share the red button. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So, um, well, yeah. I mean, the question is, you know, a lot, a lot of the time, these these um, reasons you have for for designing these things this way. What what was your approach to to deciding? I mean, you know. Nolan would just say, I don't want boobs on my, on my box, but, but was there any other, uh, what were some of the real ways that you guys just, you know, found your way to, to good user interfaces? Well, that's a good question. You know, I think the trick is building a, a, an organization that has those values kind of built in. So, I mean, Paraco was kind of an oddball and he put the boobs on, but Nolan really set the tone for what it was and hired the people that, uh, so, Opperman, for example, the Atari logo, you know, the, the Fuji symbol. Uh, when Warner Communications bought us, <laughs> uh, they uh, uh, paid Walt, uh, 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 Madison Avenue firm $100,000 to analyze our image and how people think about us and give us and try to think about maybe a better logo. And they discovered that at that time, uh, Atari had better recognition than Disney. And they said, don't touch it. And, and it turns out Opperman did that for, I think, a uh, $5,000 consulting you know, gig. And we hired him. And he was just our, he was the guy that set the graphics and set the standards. And, and I think the, the clean graphics, the non-sexual overture, that was just part of it. But beyond that, it was just trying to be innovative and see what would, see what would work. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, Keith. Uh, Kaiser shot asking um, about um, <clears throat> something about leading up to the MP3, uh, the MPEG effort at Apple. Oh, uh, and <laughs> uh oh, uh oh, what was that about? I from that. <laughs> yeah, was, was this in hardware? Did you ship? Yeah, wow, that was that was one of the most ex weird ex experiences in my life. Look, I got a I got a bachelor's degree from the University of California, and there was a great school. And that was wonderful. But all of a sudden, I'm working for Larry Tesler at, a, at, at Apple. And he says, oh, we're going to do this project of uh, compressed video compression in MPEG. And I'm going to, I got these guys to work with you, uh, Ivan Sutherland and Bob Sproul. So I'm managing a department. I'm, I'm Ivan's boss. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to have God report to me. <laughs> but we became friends. And uh, it was it was unbelievable because it was way above my head. Uh, the technical stuff that was going on, we had a Cray computer at the time. So we had the fastest computer in the world and we could actually dissect images faster than anybody else. And uh, and watching how these guys worked, uh, and I was able to coordinate some scams and some, some leverage. Uh, we also worked with uh, uh, Andy Lippman at the Media Lab as part of that project and put together uh, 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 a consortium, a group. Uh, well, at the end of the, end of the project with Ivan working uh, and their team, uh, we had a big meeting at uh, Ricky's Hyatt in Palo Alto and invited all the different companies that were doing the MPEG to share their stuff. But Andy Littman did one brilliant thing and made everybody digitize some video that we had he had digitized already and made them compress it at one megabit, put it on a CD and show it. And that, so that was the first time that all these guys had to encode the same stuff. And the answer became clear at that point that it was DCT was the best, best coding. Uh, uh, we weren't pushing DCT, Media Lab wasn't, but that was the winner. And all of a sudden, uh, the, the MPEG, focused the whole committee, the whole group, worldwide group, focused on DCT and now, off to the races. DCT stands for? Discrete cosine transform, as opposed to fractals or uh, vector quantization or any other number of approaches that were going on. Um, Danielle was going to ask a question. Um, is, could you want to unmute and ask it yourself? Sure. 
Hi, Alan. I was uh, wondering if um, if you thought if you guys had spent more on lawyers, would it have been possible to prevent more of your games getting stolen, or was it just too difficult given the technologies available at that time? Good question. It, it was that was one of Nolan's things uh, at that time. You got to realize in coin op, uh, those guys are our customers are wonderful people. But, and the competitors are wonderful people, but they're not that well financed except for Bally. And, and, and if you sued them, uh, that would just cost you a lot of money. And, uh, and, and they just go out of business and reappear somewhere else. So it was a kind of a waste of time. Uh, Magnavox did sue us uh, because Ralph, uh, Ralph Baer had a patent on arguably uh, the primitive video game stuff and and nolan was very clever they sued us right before the consumer electronics show in 1977 uh and and uh nolan said and our attorney said oh we can we can overthrow that patent it's bullshit we got, we got it and uh and we said great how much will it cost oh about a million bucks well and it's also going to cost us executive time and and when an attorney tells you how something's going to cost that means it will not cost any less than that Magnavox is willing to do a paid up license for like $600,000. Uh, and so we said, great, <laughs> goodbye attorneys. We'll just pay, we'll just, uh, pay you that, that much money. It was a fixed, it was a very clever on their part because it was just a one-time payment and we had a perpetual license. No other coin op company had a, a perpetual license. They all had to pay royalties. So we had a, wow. a better deal. So I think Nolan's uh, handling of that was pretty cool. Uh, Brando, uh, you have a question? Do you, you want to speak? Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, the amazing talk, really uh, um, incredible uh, history of the medium. Um, I, I was curious, uh, did the design of the games come from the input devices or, or vice versa? Were you, uh, were you working from starting the input? Like the, the input devices, like the, the having oh. a potentiometer or, or, a, or a steering wheel, were you starting with the what you wanted the people to do and then have the game or how did that work? No, 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 no. They, first off, you know, the way the games were designed were in the early days is pretty much Nolan had this list of games in his head uh, and he had a very short attention span, uh, which resulted in that's how breakout got done. That's another story, but no, it was the game. And then, and then we would have to design controls that would make that uh, game work back in the day when Steve Jobs was working for me, I hired Steve Jobs, I needed the tech, he was cheap. And, uh, uh, and, Nolan, and Nolan would come into the, to the lab and he'd get tired, a game would be halfway done. It would take about three months for the little team of engineers to do a game. Nolan would get bored and he'd want to change the game. And he kept doing this and nothing was gonna get out. So I couldn't keep Nolan out of engineering but I could be alerted whenever he went in. So I would stop it and I'd keep him focused. And then Nolan got pissed and he went around my back and hired got Steve Jobs. He thought Steve was an engineer. Steve's not an engineer. <laughs> and Steve didn't disabuse him of that notion. So he cut this deal with Steve to design Breakout. He described the game of Breakout to Steve and, and Steve said, sure, I'll do it. And he says, every chip less than 50, I'll give you a thousand dollar bonus. Knowing that Pong took 70 chips. So how could anybody do breakout with less than 70? Well, he got Waz to do the work. Waz did it in four days, four days and nights, nonstop. I come into work one morning and there's a finished game that wasn't even on the schedule to be designed and it's done and working. I go, what the hell? And Steve's job says, I did that. You go, bullshit, you didn't do that. And it was Waz coming in at night doing it. And, uh, and, and unfortunately the game was so clever. Waz is so brilliant, it had, I think 20 chips in it. You couldn't buy the chips. They came out of HP and they were, anyway, uh, we gave him the money. That's that argument split because jobs lied to was about how much money, but uh, we eventually had to have the game redesigned by a normal engineer. It took a hundred chips and it was a success. <laughs> that's how <laughs> games got designed. <laughs> um, wow. That's, that's amazing. Um, and so, Nicole, um, uh, do you want to unmute and, and, uh, and ask your question? Yeah, sure. Awesome. Wonderful presentation, Alan. This has been amazing, amazing. 
uh, you know, thinking about Pong and, and Breakout and um, those, those early games, in your experience, are there some examples of how HCI, again, the controls, you know, made a game more fun? Do you have any rules of thumb or insights or maybe a, maybe a fun yeah, story? Yeah, I understand HCI's uh, human, oh, uh, human computer, computer well, interaction. Yeah, I mean, I think to the extent that they fall readily to hand, you know, the game that didn't work was the early computer space because it had four buttons in a line, rotate, right, it just didn't, it didn't fall to hand. So you had to be obvious. And somehow, you know, the, the potentiometers on Pong seemed obvious to people. And, and so, and then we hired some people that knew what they were doing in that area and we continued to make, you know, so you just, you just tried to make them sure that they, they were important and they, they, they had to be durable enough to last. So like the driving game would just take tremendous abuse and uh, we managed to survive because of those control. We did have a hiccup on the first driving game. So the first, it's a long and ugly story, but the first 50 games were a disaster. We had to take them back and scrap them and, and, and redo it. They, they had done, they'd done a lot of mistakes on it. Uh, it was done without my, uh, my involvement. And then I had to come out of retirement and fix it and <laughs> do it again. But uh, yeah. You're talking about they were just physically not strong enough or there was some problem with the programming or what? Well, yeah. The research guys up in Grass Valley wanted to productize the thing. And so they did a terrible job. So they didn't have a proper wiring harness. They'd actually wired up the quadrature controllers on the steering wheels backwards. So they could never get the cars to steer right. The power supply would burn out, maybe set the thing on fire. Little things like that. It just went on. And they they had they had designed in National Semiconductor said they could make our audio because we wanted to have custom audio chip. They could do it for us. Uh, and uh, okay, and then that became two chips. Then that became three chips. Then we had some financial troubles, and National wouldn't sell to us. So now we couldn't even build the damn things because the National we were going to go out of business. Uh, literally, it was really close to scraping the bottom. And uh, so uh, I had to come back and do the old, you know, turn the crank, get it finished, get it out. So um, back, back to this uh, question I thought that was really important about the HCI. Um, you know, it probably didn't seem that important or, or that big a problem because you had all these terrible problems with electronics and physical design and, and difficulties. But can you remember any of the really bad um interfaces that you built ones that that really didn't work and you kind of you kind of alluded to the 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 way to finesse the third person view of a car yeah that was interesting well, that actually was a good game and if you think about it if you ever get a chance to play the driving game you know it just seems obviously that's the way it's supposed to work but it but you know it's not the natural way to do things i think one of the worst games well products we ever did uh, we, after we introduced the Atari VCS, which is arguably one of the hit products of the decade, uh, then six months later at the, no, excuse me, six months before we introduced the, the CES, at the CES, we introduced a product called Video Music. Have you ever heard of this thing? It was horrible. It basically coupled, connected your hi-fi stereo to the color TV interfaced and made a dazzling light show on the television set. And, uh, and, and Nolan put a nice wood cabinet for it, a little home box, beautiful, looked like a piece of expensive audio gear. And we said, we're gonna, our first run, we're gonna build 10,000 of them. Uh, manufacturing looked at it and said, this is a dog. They only built a thousand and we couldn't even sell those. <laughs> it was terrible. And uh, so that was that was a disaster. I wouldn't say it was because of the interface. It was just a bunch of push buttons, but it was a terrible, terrible game. I don't know, uh, the worst human interface thing. I, 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 I don't know. I, I Well, I think your row, your row of buttons not being ergonomic. Yeah, of course that wasn't really my fault. That was, that was Nolan's fault. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the guy with the monkey wrench at the Sears store. <laughs> yeah. So we have a couple of questions about MPEG, uh, on, on MPEG and, and stuff, but I kind of, uh, Nicole has another question about uh, a statement about Pong, um, you know, being more interesting because when it had spin on it. Do you want to say anything about that? Oh yeah, yeah, the spin. So the original way the game was described, I did it exactly as Nolan asked, the ball would bounce off the paddle 
and uh, and it was and, and and it would I had to do angles. That was very hard to do the angles because you wanted to have the angles off the paddle symmetrical. So there were three above, three below, and a center shot. That's not a binary number. <laughs> so that took hard a bit of logic to get that to work out. Um, but um, the the spin on the paddle, it really wasn't spin. It was wherever it hit on the paddle would lock in a, a, a count from the height of the paddle and then set it off at the angle that, 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 it, that it went at. Uh, uh, but because the, the, then the machine it sped up, we realized that if the ball was at one speed, it was boring, it wouldn't work. Uh, it was obvious. So then I added speed up. So there were like three levels of speed up and it got pretty fast. So the angles would appear to change, but it really wasn't looking at angles. It was looking at vertical speeds and horizontal speeds. And uh, uh, so, so by adding the speeds, it made it interesting and playable. And uh, I remember at one point, Playboy magazine came in and interviewed me and Nolan about the paddles and about the spin, because everybody was wondering about, they all thought he had to spin the paddle. And, uh, and I was impressed the Playboy had such editorial integrity that they would come in to the right source and ask us, uh, uh, what it was <laughs> so there's there's a question from brand uh brandel can you do you want to take the mic please sure uh so uh based on where hardware is to today are, are there any particular input devices that you would be excited to to dabble with in, in terms of entertainment oh, man. Uh, what, what know, would what would you jump into now well about Five years ago, I, I would have said virtual reality because I could see that everything was coming together. So all of a sudden it was possible. A, a, as you might know, Ivan Sutherland really was the pioneer in uh, 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 VR stuff way back 30, 40 years ago. God. And uh, but it was really, really expensive. And uh, but Jesus, all of a sudden it became and I, just such an amazing effect. And, and uh, I'm just disappointed that. It just didn't have the promise. It didn't. It didn't uh, fulfill my expectations. So I would have really, really, really bet on that one. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm going to weigh in on this just a moment because there's something you said earlier that I thought was kind of sad, but maybe telling. Which is, you know, you made that Zoe, uh, Zowie, and you know, today we have radar on this uh, Pixel Four, which nobody much uh, notices, um, and and maybe the. The question is, story might be more important even than technology. Oh yeah, it's got to have, it's got to have a story. And even if you think about pinball machines, they got a story. You know, that ball is you going through life, and no matter how shitty things are, you could win a replay just on dumb luck at the end. So I think that that's part of it, and certainly the all the games pretty much had that. I think Pong didn't accept. Pong was unique in that it appealed because it wasn't a masculine game. It, it appealed to women and it opened up a, a, a lot of women could play it and compete in, in an environment. And I think that helped it, uh, helped it to uh, succeed. Yeah. Um, okay. We got this gotcha question. Uh, uh, Kaiser, do you want to, uh, Keith, do you want to, um, do you want to see, see, uh, ask that question? What led to the development of the release of Gotcha, one of the first color arcade games? Did Nolan ask for oh. that as another exercise? How did the hardware? For no, that no, that was got to realize that we we were growing like a rocket ship. We were, you know, four or five guys that did this. And all of a sudden, we get hit in the ass by lightning, and we had to put a production together. Uh, and, 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 you know, in a startup company, you're doing everything from emptying the garbage cans and all that. And somehow we had to design the next game and, uh, I just had to do it. And I was inspired by a defective pong board. And so I was able to whip that game out pretty quickly. The color aspect, I think the first gotcha wasn't in color, but then later on we re-released it with an RGB color with uh, uh, direct RGB drive to, to, to the thing. I don't think color, I, my personal belief is I don't think color enhances uh, certainly the early games that much, but it would seem to appealing the operators liked it. So we, we went that way. Um, and Nippon, uh, do you want to speak about uh, this uh, question you had? 
Um, you made a comment about uh, not about not wanting to put instructions. Seemed an interesting design principle. What? Uh, what? How far did you take instructions on any of the games? Were so so yeah, other other than that first one? You had that beautiful three list thing. How wh- how did the instructions go for other things? I think they were all very simple. I mean, really, it, it was. If you had to, I still believe if you had to read the instructions, you were in trouble. Uh, although today, I wish there were more instructions on many of the games because people falsely assume that it's obvious. And, and there's so many, you know, the human interface on, on, a, uh, on an iPhone is so varied. You don't know whether you're supposed to poke it, touch it, swipe it, spit on it, what. And uh, they often just assume that you're going to figure this out. So. And I'm getting old, and I don't figure things out that well anymore. <laughs> um, Lisa Rose said that she thought that Jaron, uh, he coined the term virtual reality. Uh, certainly, there was stuff going on in Phillips, at MIT, yeah. and uh, other places uh, of that sort long before Jaron was uh, out yeah. of uh, grade school. Um, right. But Jaron did, did contribute yeah. greatly. He had, the, he had the balls to go build some of the first systems, and I loved it. I played with them, and my kids loved it. And, but it, it wasn't a home thing, and it was really out of the question for coin-op stuff. You know, it has to be pretty cheap to, to, to do that. Uh, Callie, Carol, you want to say something? Well... No, I could. Okay. I was just <laughs> I physical think, uh, means. Oh yeah, just that um, the you know the Zowie game kind of the being able to move things around and then have it work remotely. Also, it just comes up again and again, like right. you know, you know, and it and everyone acts like it's new, but it's not. Picking up a figurine, putting it on something, it tells oh, a yeah. story, etc. And we had yeah. we had a girl's version with the uh, Ellie's garden and we had a boy's version with a pirate ship and uh, it was it was a it was a, 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 a lot of fun I mean I think the, the games it makes a lot of sense but I, I don't I don't see that being done people they substitute put push pushing your finger on a touch screen right yeah so uh, we have we have a more technical question couple of questions I'd kind of put them off Jeffrey Perone you want to say something I ask about the the stealth ship stuff. Yeah, so I, I thought that was brilliant about naming your custom chip with the same name as a another standard chip to uh, foil the people copying it. How did that come about? If you could say a little bit more about that, and uh, is there a name for that? It's almost kind of like it's like stealth trade secret pres- preservation. I don't know. I I I think that was. That was that was just I stumbled across that one. It was my idea um, because when the when the vendor called me, I had to come up. I'm sorry. Say again, Al. Yeah. Well, when the vendor told me that I had to have a part number for the custom part, and it could be oh. And it turns out in our catalog of uh, part company part numbers, 74 was the prefix for chips. So you go, hey, I could have some fun with this. Why not? Because the, the, this is a, a CMOS company. They weren't making any TTL. And so they happily did it. And uh, a couple of, uh, couple of our competitors tried to buy the 74181 from, I forget the name of the company. But anyway, they went out of business. And I would get a list of who was asking for the part. <laughs> it, was, it was kind of fun. We didn't do anything about it. We just had fun. We'd, and we, we'd have a lot of fun when they complained. Their chip kept blowing up. What do you mean? <laughs> it was just fun. You had, to have a, you had to have a little fun with the customers. Absolutely. I, I, I think that that um, idea of the creativity being um, partly uh, a sense of humor is, is really uh, a serious Serious business in in um, how how one really makes makes something that 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 has that has legs. Um, I'm getting uh, ready to think that we might be getting to the end. It's now nine o'clock, but um, I, I do think that there are a couple more comments that people have made um, that we, um, if any of you really are, um, you know, seriously want to say something more. Um, 
uh, put in your question again, and we'll 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 try to give you a last chance to to uh, ask Al. Um, and by the way, Al, I I would I would concur. I've heard you speak before, but uh, this this was really uh, the fi my favorite talk you've given because of its overview and the in depth aspect of of how you explain some of the problems that you had and solved uh, in these incredibly creative ways. Well, and so I'm really enjoying this. It was been, it's been a ride for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been it's a great ride, and uh, and we're not dead yet. Uh, so that's that's the good part. Um, I'm seeing a lot of people saying, uh, great talk, thank you, thank you very much. I want everyone to know that um, you can point people at the Beikai site, uh, and very quickly, very soon, uh, Steve Williams, the great, will um, will make sure that this video is up so that other people can, can, uh, um, can, can watch it too. And I hope that this uh, uh, attracts lots of, lots of people to see that. Um, and Al, I, I look forward to uh, having you, you know, getting together with you again. I was almost, yeah. looking, I was almost looking up a video a, a couple of years ago. I had you play with uh, the Magic Leap uh, yeah. mixed reality system that I that I've been working yep. on. And there's some really great pictures I showed around Magic Leap of you of you wearing this thing and 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 uh, jumping up and down in 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 uh, full criticism mode. Um, Lots of ideas and, and and appropriate thoughts about what was right and what was wrong. Um, so I think uh, you still got it. And uh, anybody that gets gets a chance to have you critique their their user experience, I think they should take advantage of that. Um, and uh, with that, I think I will um, um, just uh, thank you very much. And I think we can uh, we can call that the end of the evening's uh, formal session. Um, and if anybody wants to open up their mic and squawk a little bit, that's fine. But uh, we'll be we'll be going off the air in a couple of minutes here. Oh well, thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and I'm glad I'm delighted that you guys enjoyed it. So it's yeah, been a while. Delighted to have you share this uh, journey with us too. This has been fun. <laughs>